To help us make sense of all this is Keith Knight, Managing Editor for the Libertarian Institute and the author of The Voluntarist Handbook, a collection of essays, excerpts, and quotes. Keith, thanks for being here tonight. Carter, thank you so much for having me. Great. So tax taxation and war, the two big themes of your book. But before we get into your book, and I want to dive into it, first I just want to get your thoughts on the Fed's meddling in the economy because time and time again we see them, you know, causing problems and then saying, oh, let us come in and fix the problem and round and round we go on this. Yeah, very bad uh, report card for the Federal Reserve created in, I think, 1913 to stop the existence of inflation and stop recessions. And of course, recessions have gotten more steep and we've had a less stable dollar since. So very uh, classic example of people having standards for only the private sector. And when government does something terrible, it's like, well, I certainly hope they uh, fix things. But this is exactly what we should expect because in the private sector, in the free market, we can clearly see that if one group were given a monopoly on computers, we would get higher prices because they wouldn't face competition and they wouldn't be on their toes to please con customers. So we'd have lower quality, lower quality and higher prices is what you get with monopoly. However, when it comes to the state granting the Federal Reserve a monopoly on the currency, as they did in 1913, well, then people are just shocked that all of a sudden they haven't kept the dollar stable. And then, of course, they define inflation incorrectly. They say inflation is when prices go up. Notice this doesn't differentiate from when there's a shortage of a good or service or when something's in demand versus when there's a drastic increase in the money supply. So the inflation is the increase in the money supply. The high prices are the result of this uh, monetary uh, expenditure. That is uh, basically all I have on the Federal Reserve, uh, that they should be open to competition just like any other organization. The reason they're bad is because they have a uh, state-created monopoly. No, that's exactly right. And it also it reminds me just the other week I saw a headline that I thought was kind of funny. It was J.P. Morgan Chase, the bank, uh, worrying and, and, you know, sounding the alarm bells about the national debt and talking about how, how scary and how bad, you know, that we might be hitting a breaking point. But then I think back to the creation of the Federal Reserve itself and the real J.P. Morgan and, you know, Jekyll, you know, Jekyll Island, Georgia, and how part of the reason why the Fed was created was so that big banks could keep playing with debt and keep, you know, the, the way the Fed was able to do so that consequences were kind of distributed. So allowed banks to take on greater risk for greater profits. But of course, they didn't really have to deal with the fallout of those risks, just the everyday Americans. So it's just kind of funny how this all ends up always working out. But also quickly before we get to your book, talking about regime change, because uh, that's a, that's another big one. You see left, right, center, there's hawks everywhere. And even people who feel so well-meaning, because I mean, you know, I've, I'd consider myself a fan of Dr. Peterson, read his books, you know, listen to his lectures. Sometimes things get a little kinky more recently, but uh, you know, I, he thinks he's coming from a good place, right? We can save the women of, of Iran. We can save the people of Iran more broadly if only we overthrow their government. Uh, you know, <laughs> your thoughts. My thoughts. Uh, let me just make something up on the fly. Uh, Dr. Peterson, before we go into other countries, let's clean up our own rooms <laughs> and make sure the rooms are clean before we go around trying to tell other people how the world should be run. Now, it's still important to have an objective sense of morality that if I commit murder but do it in Iran, of course, I've still committed an uh, unjust action, whether I do it in Iran or China or anywhere else. So having these principles standing strong and saying right from wrong is vitally important. But before getting into what should happen there, let's take a look at the last major justified war that the United States was involved in. In around October of 2001, the US and uh, NATO, late September, early October, the North American Treaty Organization declared Article 5, which is war, for the first time in, then it had to have been their 52 year history. Never going to war against the Soviet Union, NATO declared war against Afghanistan. And after tens of thousands of civilian deaths, thousands of dead American soldiers, trillions spent, tons of guys getting their limbs blown off, kids losing their parents, the Taliban took over in 11 days after 20 years. So he thinks that that is the organization that should go fix things up in Iran. And it's the same organization that says, look, we might have to go to war with the nuclear power Russia if they go into the Donbass region, and we might have to go to war with nuclear China if they go into Taiwan. The reality is uh, we don't have the ability, knowledge, resources, courage, compassion to clean up South Phoenix, Chicago, and Baltimore, and they think we're going to have regime change and issue stability 
in Tehran and Taipei and Kiev. It is absolutely ridiculous. So uh, that is the empirical justification for why you would oppose something. The war that they had every incentive to win, the Afghanistan war, was a complete debacle, not to mention Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Libya. They never even get any airtime because uh, the, because they're so uh, impossible to defend. So I think it's terrible. Also, this creates a cultural degradation that Peterson might appreciate, that whenever politicians or cultural figures see a problem in the world and they say, you know what, government should step in and do that. What the population hears is instead of negotiating, instead of engaging in mutually beneficial trades, instead of trying to innovate and saying, what can we do to make freedom so attractive that those people want it for themselves, the government will just use the violence of F-15s or the police force. This leads to a population who is not keen on thinking about how to solve problems and is so quick to say, this upsets me, I'm going to call the police. I'm super triggered. I can't handle this. You've committed a microaggression against me. I now have to cancel you. So this is one of the aspects of snowflake culture that stops people from cognitively analyzing things in an in-depth way. So empirically, historically, and then morally, you're going to end up murdering innocent civilians every single time. I don't like Joe Biden. I don't want regime change in America coming from Canada because then I could maybe just start defending Joe Biden and that would be really bad. So uh, those are my principled and empirical uh, justifications to oppose uh, U.S. intervention in Iran. Well, Keith, now I have to ask you, voluntarism, what is it? Why do we need a handbook for it? Explain your book for us. This is a philosophy which dares to take principles that we all hold for each other and apply them to the state. So, for example, many people will advocate a philosophy that says something like, thou shall not murder and thou shall not steal. However, whenever I ask people, should Joe Biden go to jail for murdering seven children and three adults on August 29th, 2021 in Kabul? Because if I did that, obviously I'd be in jail. If Kara did it or anyone else at OAN, they'd be in jail. If a priest did it, they'd be in jail. Why is there this double standard with Joe Biden or politicians in general? And you try to get to the root of what the real difference is between the state and the rest of society. When it comes to something like taxation or military conscription, which Vladimir Zelensky instituted on February 24th of last year, imagine if I tried forcing people to work for me in the most gruesome conditions, whether they wanted to or not. He did this for all men ages 18 to 60. How would you call me anything except a kidnapper or a slave owner? Or if I tried issuing taxes so I could fund some operations that I have at the Libertarian Institute, well, then I'd be called a thief. This book is about getting to the principal distinction between barbaric behavior and civilized behavior. And that is civilized behavior involves parties acting uh, mutually, beneficially, through a process of consent and voluntary exchange. Only reason people would make an exchange, give you a penny out of their pocket, or give you a second of their time, is if they think it's in their interest to do so. And when they stop believing so, they could go elsewhere, because you face competition in the free market and in social life. But when it comes to the state, the defining characteristic is not roads, it's not security, it's not schools. All of those things have been performed privately, and they're done much better privately. What makes government a unique institution is it claims these rights to initiate violence against peaceful people to achieve their ends, a right that no one else has. So it makes perfect sense, whether it's Biden murdering civilians in Afghanistan or Trump murdering civilians in Yemen. People say, you know what, he should be impeached for having documents inside of his house. And Trump had a phone call that was very questionable. It's never the biggest thing. So the Voluntarist Handbook involves people having no longer having a double standard for the state when it comes to war, taxation, and regulation through commerce. So that is my principled argument. Here are uh, some empirical reasons to uh, support a, support a uh, philosophy of libertarianism or voluntarism and voluntary exchanges. The three things that government, certainly in my lifetime, probably my parents' lifetime, has gotten most involved in would be healthcare, schooling, and housing. And what have we seen in those three sectors? We've seen a drastic increase, as anyone would expect. More subsidies and more regulation means producers are answering to politicians and they're not answering to consumers. 
they could care much less. Same with uh, airlines with uh, regard to Pete Buttigieg and the FAA. But in things like computers, microphones, cell phones, ceiling fans, air conditioning units, televisions, all of these are going down in price, even though they continue to go up in quality and are more environmentally friendly because they get thinner every year. They can do much more with a lot less. Those things are less regulated and less subsidized. So if you care not just about civilization and right and wrong, but if you care about the poor and the downtrodden and the vulnerable, you should also embrace this philosophy that is sometimes called libertarianism or voluntarism. And so in your book, as it says, and I believe the subtitle essays, uh, excerpts and quotes, uh, who or what thinkers can we expect to see also contained within the book? You can see people on the right, such as Joe Sobrin. He was the senior editor right under Willie F. Buckley from the National Review. He was there for 18 years. He has a chapter titled The Reluctant Anarchist, where he says, look, uh, I, I'm always big on government because government has a security force that keeps us safe. However, historically, if we look at you know, the Franco-Prussian War, the World War, the Second World War, Vietnam, Korea. It seems like all of these terrible people are government. So, yes, it's possible that there might be bad people in a free market society or one that didn't have a state, but there's always going to be bad people. The problem is when you have a state apparatus, the most evil people not only go there, it even allows good people to justify doing bad things under the guise of, I was just following orders, or don't blame me, the voters elected me, if they don't like me, they can do something else. So that is one of the insights from the right. From someone on the left, we have a guy, uh, Sheldon Richman, one of my colleagues at the Libertarian Institute, and he says that the idea, uh, the, the great false dichotomy that people like Barack Obama put out is, government is this thing in society that we all do together. And other things are things people do by themselves, and that's the dichotomy he lays out. It's a completely false one, because think that even if you are reading a book, you didn't write the book, you didn't chop down the tree to make the pages, you didn't make the ink, you're probably uh, using a light bulb, and you didn't invent light bulbs, you don't generate your own electricity, you drove a car someone else made to get the book. We are constantly cooperating, even at the moment of doing something by ourselves. So the false dichotomy, things we do together versus things we do alone, that's ridiculous. What Sheldon Richman and the leftist mentality brings to this is we are constantly always cooperating. So should, recognizing this, should this cooperation be based on mutually beneficial voluntary exchanges, or should we give one group the right to monopolize coercing all others? And look how divisive it is. It's like... Think of how but Trump was a little divisive when he was running The Apprentice. There's this guy, he says, you're fired, and he rubs it in, and that's not good. But no one was out screaming and protesting and saying the world's going to end and losing their minds and cutting off friendships because of what Donald Trump did in the private sector. It's what Donald Trump did in the public sector. Now, this is completely backwards to what progressives have told us the reality is. They say, in the private sector, people are dangerous and predatory, and it's doggy dog but in the public sector, they work for us. It's the exact opposite, like almost everything else that uh, progressives told me in school. So it, it embracing the philosophy of a government, which allows some people to initiate violence against peaceful people for purposes of taxes, for purposes of war and conscription and regulation, it's constantly dividing the populace amongst each other, making things much more hostile than they otherwise would be. They're constantly provoking black versus white, men versus women, rich versus poor, America versus Russia. There's no reason any of those groups should be against each other. What you could do is have a principal divide and say that people who engage peacefully and voluntarily in their lives are good people, and people that use coercion, theft, rape, kidnapping, assault, war, taxation, conscription, those are the bad people in society. So this book really does allow you to have a true sense of how people should be divided in the world. I mean, just imagine uh, the Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons who come to my house and they say, look, man, t there's bad news. You're on your way to going to hell for all of eternity, but we're going to give you the opportunity to not go there. And here's what you can do. And they respect me so much that if I say no, they will literally let me choose to burn in a fiery pit for all of eternity if I say no to them. But then when it comes to political beliefs, it's like, 
well, I'm not going to let you opt out of funding schools, or I'm not going to let you opt out of funding war. If you don't pay your taxes, chip into the mass murdering government, well, then you should have to go to jail. This is how divisive government makes us. It hurts us every day because it creates divisiveness amongst people of goodwill. But that is what I think people will learn from the Voluntarist Handbook. You don't even have to give me a dime. Go to libertarianinstitute.org and get yourself a free PDF. Well, Keith, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for adding to this conversation. I really like seeing it from different angles and different perspectives. I really appreciate yours. Thanks for joining us tonight. Anytime, Cara. Thank you for having me.